In this presentation, we're going to take a journey into a multiplayer online game where a group of gamers from different geographical locations played for over three years. I, who was also part of this group, tried to look for evidence on how the game environment, culture, and social dynamics could support second language socialization, a process by which a second language learner could become a competent member of the target language community. On our journey today, we're going to explore different parts of my research, including the field, questions, theoretical framework, methodology, data sources, results, and implications. All right, let me tell you how it all began. I joined a UK game world out of the 77 worlds from which players could choose to see what multiplayer online game environments offered in terms of engagement. As I'd seen many of my language learners playing them, even during the class. To my astonishment, my students were constantly using English to communicate outside the class, assuming high office roles and leading battles against competing factions and houses. This level of interaction contrasted with what I knew of my students from their class activities. They were integral members of a virtual community collaborating to dominate the land. It seemed that the environment of the game brought out the best of language learning qualities that were visibly missing from their experiences in my class. After farming about almost two years, the way players refer to those casually and peacefully building, I received an invitation to join a faction, which is a group of people banding together under the same banner, and I, looking for adventure, accepted it. I had played solo for a long time and I wanted to experience the communal feel of the game. Logging into the game the next day, I found that all the villages around me were marked with red swords. Then, a message from a friend sent a chill down my spine. Hi, Vahid. Hope you're good so far. I was wondering why you have swords now. That means enemy. Can you do something against that? I panicked. I had turned into an enemy overnight. All I knew was that I had accepted the faction invite the night before, and I was now an enemy to many whom I had befriended since I joined the game. What a world! Shocked at what I had done, and thinking of leaving the so-called faction, I received a welcome message from the faction general, Morning Destroyer. Then I began to receive other messages about the war efforts and strategies. These group conversations coordinated the activities of the faction members, with players actively contributing to the shared goal of the faction surviving the relentless onslaught of House 16, Lionheart, and their allies who ruled over the UK. I was now part of this community with its norms and dynamics. I saw myself helping the cause, sending supplies, troops, and monks to the first line of defense, and at the same time, attacking and capturing enemy villages. And the next three years were full of such gaming interactions. An exciting journey which spanned the inception and end of a UK world and immigration to a new USA world. So now that you know more about my journey, let's take a look at the field. Stronghold Kingdoms, the game I chose as my field, is a medieval themed strategy game where players from around the world can join different servers or worlds using a PC, Mac, or portable Android or iOS device. In August 2017, when I was still engaged in my research, the game hosted 77 worlds in 9 languages – English, German, Russian, French, Polish, Italian, Turkish, Portuguese, and Chinese. Based on the estimates at the time, Stronghold Kingdoms hosted 5 million active players, which could be compared to that of a real-world country like Norway, 
As I shared earlier, I played a UK mapped world for about five years before it ended, and my fellow players and I had to immigrate to a US mapped world. To get a better idea of how the game works, how about we watch the game trailer? Greetings, sir. Your kingdom awaits. Stronghold Kingdoms. Your village is one of a thousand others. Make it the pride of the parish. Plan and construct your settlements to maximize their potential. Use special cards to your advantage. Tailor make your personal avatar. Explore new disciplines to gain the upper hand. Everything from salt working to siege mechanics. Hundreds of quests and achievements to challenge and reward you. Gather your forces, fight for glory, and dominate the land. Can you handle the pressure? Build the ultimate stronghold. Ready your defenses. And prepare for a medieval strategy experience unlike any other. Now that you're familiar with the field of the study, let's take a look at the research questions. The questions which led this inquiry were, one, what are the socio-cultural affordances of the faction community for second language socialization? And two, how does the faction community shape and support the non-native English speakers development of linguistic skills? This study was framed in a traditional research on second language socialization, which explores the process through which a second language learner socializes into the norms of the second language community, gaining membership, legitimacy, and linguistic competence. Similarly, multiplayer online games have a dynamic culture with geographically scattered players building a community with its own norms. In order to socialize into the norms of this community, communication is key. Therefore, second language socialization could provide a useful theoretical framework for this study, examining how language skills could shape and simultaneously be shaped by one's socialization. The communities of practice framework meshes well with the tenets of second language socialization. Simply put, a community of practice is a group of people who gather around a shared interest and participate in communal activities. Similarly, the players in a multiplayer online game come from different backgrounds, but they form groups and collaborate towards the accomplishment of shared goals. This requires the player's active participation in a community that has shared goals and threats uniting them in the face of challenges. Furthermore, a community of practice supports members' learning and development through social interactions between less and more proficient members of the community. Through this interaction, 
new members who are considered novices gradually develop a general idea of the practices of the community. In other words, a new member or a novice is initially peripheral in a community, but they will gradually evolve to fill a central position in that community. The process which is referred to as peripheral legitimate participation. Research into second language socialization has traditionally been conducted through ethnographies to explore the relevant macro and micro dimensions of the context. Ethnography is one of the oldest qualitative methodologies which provides detailed, holistic, and emic descriptions of cultural behaviors through detailed observations of a field over time as well as in-depth interviews with participants. Therefore, in this study, I used ethnographic methods to explore the socio-cultural norms of the multiplayer online game I was playing. The participants were a faction of eight native English speakers and two non-native English speakers. The native English speaker members of the faction were from English-speaking countries, two male participants from England, and one female and five male participants from the United States. The non-native English speaker members were a female participant from Sweden and a male participant from Egypt. All participants were considered experienced as they had played more than two years together, although joining the faction at varying degrees of competence. I, likewise, was part of this community for more than three years and this study focused on my three-year journey with them. The participants were aware that I was collecting data for the purpose of this study. All names are pseudonyms. This study was informed by three data sources, records or artifacts, observation and interview. Records or artifacts consisted of players' interactions over forums and chat servers. As these social venues stored valuable data on community participation, I analyzed the discourse in community threads to develop a formal survey of the field. Also, ethnographic research relies heavily on observation, which enables the researchers to attend the field, use their senses, take field notes, and write thick descriptions of the culture into which they enter. Finally, after identifying possible second language socialization themes based on the results of observations and analysis of records, I created a semi-structured interview protocol to tap the identified themes and inquire into more information about the second language socialization process with a specific reference to the participants' gaming journey. Analysis of records and observation helped answer the first research question, while the interview helped answer the second research question. The first credibility measure was my five-year gaming experience. I had been playing the game for a long time and knew the setting very well. Furthermore, over these years, I had risen through the ranks and positioned myself as a high-ranking player who could enter closed circles and be trusted. Therefore, it was easy for me to be both a fly on the wall and at the same time a participant observer. However, despite the benefits of this stance, there was one caveat, being biased in interpretation. To address this limitation, I tried to minimize this risk through member checks and peer debriefing throughout the study. I had about 10% of my data intercoded by a colleague. I also presented my participants with my data analysis to ascertain that our accounts did not differ. The other credibility measure was to triangulate three data sources. The sequence of data collection progressively developed into a more representative picture of second language socialization in the stronghold kingdoms. In addition, throughout different phases, I relied upon intercoder checks to ascertain the accuracy of the data I was coding. Finally, in writing the report, I drew from my experiences in understanding what was taking place and I strove for clarity in my thick description while relating the findings of each data source. 
allowing the readers to judge for themselves the credibility of the findings. To analyze the records, I conducted two levels of coding, open and axial. First, I conducted the open coding of the in-game faction messages. Next, I tried to find relationships between the generated codes and transform them into categories and concepts. I used Atlas TI to organize the data for coding. At the beginning stages of the research, I came up with the codes based on the title of chat thread, for example, activity thread. But as the research progressed, I refined my codes and came up with more representative codes and categories for the data. In other words, through grouping and renaming in Atlas TI, the codes evolved as each phase of data collection was completed. In this section, I present the results from the four phases of the study, War Against the World, Post-War Peace and Life in Exile, End of the World, and Immigration to a New World. Communication runs across all themes in a multiplayer online game where players do not physically interact. For instance, the invitation that I received from Morning Destroyer to join their faction was a form of communication that was prevalent in the game. The language that players use to advance a threat, devalue a player, make a request, position oneself as a competent player, recruit a player, etc. We're all part of communication. The faction members were from the US, Britain, Egypt, Sweden, and Iran, and their being on different time zones prevented them from logging on to the game all at the same time. Besides, some worked at regular jobs and had their own non-game responsibilities. Therefore, the players created a system of login hours at which they connected to the server and engage in collaborative tasks. One of the most important tasks during the war was timed attacks, where two or more players coordinated their attacks to inflict maximum destruction on the enemy's castles. Faction members supported each other throughout the war. This support ranged from an early welcome, supplying goods, advice on skills development, to collaborations on faction defense and attack. In other words, in the faction community, shared activities were performed through supports provided by the community members in many forms. It was necessary for the members to know how to survive a conflict, especially one against the whole world. So a large amount of data highlighted skills, tactics, and strategies to survive during the war. Timed attacks, for instance, required a lot of skills, which the faction members developed over time. The faction community valued rules, which were explicitly announced every time a new faction threat was created. Generally, the domestic rules of the faction were negotiated in a panel composed of the faction general and other officers, and later shared with the other members through regular proclamations. The members, although at war, were very close. They knew each other very well, they cared about each other, checked on each other, joked about things, and felt responsible for their friends' assets. Also, they trusted each other. Despite continuous psychological and physical warfare, the members stayed together and defended their territory until they were defeated. There were multiple times during the war when they specifically shared their dedication to the cause. During the war, players intentionally showed their status to opponents in different ways, such as referencing the history and names, showing confidence, signing their messages with their ranks and positions, boasting about or hinting at their skills, and using commands or capital letters. After about a month of intense conflicts, we were defeated. The Alliance had more forces and players, and this unbalanced battle would eventually have to end in favor of HAL 16. All the gold had been spent, faith points used, and most of our villages had been captured or razed. There was no point in continuing the war. So we decided to activate the vacation mode, which is a game feature which allows players to stay away from the game for three weeks without losing any assets. In other words, it was a tactical retreat. 
But aside from that, we did need to leave. The war had drained everyone, both in real and virtual lives. After two weeks, we all deactivated vacation mode and logged back to the game. Things had calmed down and nobody was after us. Also, to avoid confrontation, we left the faction and stayed neutral, but we were still communicating. The whole world was now controlled by House 16. Most of the activities in this phase of the faction life revolved around shared experiences and support. Faction members reflected on what happened during the war, sharing memories and discussing occurrences. Also, members planned for the future, whether they wanted to create a faction and join a different house, go rogue, or go separate ways. Ultimately, we decided to farm. We created a new faction and joined House 20, which, in a nationwide vote, had been reserved for players who wanted peace. The war had officially ended and we needed supplies to build up the remainder of our villages, which had been pillaged or ransacked multiple times during the war. We needed to develop our economic industries, along with carts and markets to trade goods. We also needed to charter new villages, and as we had lost almost all of our gold and honor points, we needed to sell our goods in the markets and hold banquets to rank up. Therefore, we created a support thread and posted our needs and offered help. Everyone tried hard to rise and help others to rise as well. After several rounds of glory race and global wars, the world was close to an end. Based on the rules, all active players received a strategy card, with higher ranked players and those in the winning house receiving more perks and diamond cards. This phase of data analysis sees a great deal of planning for the next world to which players wanted to immigrate. Here we see four themes emerging out of the analysis of records. Rules, closeness, excitement, and communication. As to the rules, the world was coming to an end and players wanted to know what would happen next, who would win the race, how would the world end, what were the prizes, how would they be given to players, who would get them, and many other inquiries of this sort. We had never finished a world, so this was a new experience for all of us. Therefore, the players inquired about the end of the world frequently. As to closeness, here we see many attempts for the faction members to be together in the new world. As to excitement, we were so excited that the game was ending. This gaming journey had been filled with happy and sad memories for all of us, and now there was a new world that we hoped we would start together again. One month before the world ended, Two of the faction players, Trail and Bear, joined USA 1, which had just started, to help accommodate us there. They reported back about the area, the neighbors, and existing factions and houses in USA 1. In other words, they were scouting the area, making sure that we would enter a safe place. As to the final theme, there was a lot of communication over team building in USA 1. We were part of House 20, the peace-loving house, so we were mostly in contact with other faction members of House 20, and we hoped that they would join us. Therefore, we started communicating with other members to see if they were interested in joining the house in USA 1. Finally, the world ended on day 1555 at 11.2 pm, game time, when House 16 pressed the end the world button. For a few days, logging into the game would show us fireworks in a gaming way on a frozen world. After a few days, the world got deactivated and no login was possible. Therefore, as planned, we immigrated to USA 1. Here, again, we see the emergence of the themes, support and rules. The hardest part with a new world is that one needs to start from the very lowest rank. And when one is used to a full repository, it is not easy. Therefore, we needed support, which was the reason why our faction members, Bear and Treld, had settled down in East Washington before us. Upon our entry in the world, we messaged each other and created our communication channels. 
One of those channels was our support thread, where we requested what we needed and all the faction members helped. Also, a new world has many rules to follow, most of them similar to what we were used to in our previous world. As new settlers, we needed to be briefed on the new land's rules so that we did not cross any lines that could potentially lead to a new unwanted conflict. In other words, our experience of the previous world made us cautious at the beginning. To recap, the different eras experienced by Brown Eagle triggered different group dynamics among its members. Although all categories of norms were at work in all eras, some were more salient during a specific eras. For instance, the breakout of war mobilized almost all categories, that is collaboration, scale, support, rules, closeness, trust, communication, and status. The era of post-war peace showed shared experiences and support. End of the world showed rules, closeness, excitement, and communication and immigration to a new world showed support and rules. To explore the affordances of the faction community for language development, I conducted an in-depth interview with the Egyptian member of the faction, Mido. I used a semi-structured interview format with six main questions and many probes. The interview was conducted through the text mode of Discord, which is an audio chat client the players used to communicate. I originally had plans to interview Tikeno, the Swedish participant as well, but she was unavailable for an interview while the study was in progress. Mido was a 27-year-old Egyptian gamer who spoke Arabic as his first language. He had been playing the game for more than five years and was playing other games and multiple worlds at the time of the interview. He had assumed different social roles in Stronghold Kingdoms and other multiplayer online games. He had learned English in school, but he believed that speaking with a native English speaker in the game was important in developing language skills, helping him to learn, quote, new vocabulary, end quote, and, quote, improve the structure of sentences and grammar, end quote. He also mentioned another multiplayer online game called Angels Online that he had played, which helped him with, quote, remembering the language, end quote. He believed that playing as part of a team was more enjoyable as, quote, you do a part and others do another part, end quote. He was generally not interested in taking so many responsibilities, so he had refrained from assuming high office roles, which would put him, quote, in front line, end quote. Mapping his written interview lines on an IELTS writing task rubric could place him in the sixth band score level, descriptive of a very good language user. Of course, I could not know how much of this proficiency was achieved through gaming, but gaming, as he acknowledged, contributed to his proficiency. The findings of this study support the idea of considering Brown Eagle a community of practice where players formed communal ties, gathered around a shared domain, and engaged in shared activities to accomplish shared goals. In this dynamic community, newcomers could receive support from more proficient gamers, moving from a peripheral to a central position in the community. As can be seen in this diagram, the faction members who came from different backgrounds and gaming experiences gathered around their interests and formed communal ties while engaging in shared activities in the face of changing times. War united them against an external enemy. Peace gave them a chance to rise again. The end of the world had them excitedly plan for the future, and immigration gave them hope to live together at peace. The range of activities required to live during each time was unique and at the same time recurrent. Only the priorities changed. For instance, while communication and collaboration were essential communal activities during all times, they were vital during the war, as the faction faced an existential threat. Elements which helped the members stand together during the three-year journey were communication, collaboration, support, trust, excitement, closeness, and status. These elements, on the one hand, interacted with the community practices, such as the knowledge and observance of rules, 
development of skills and shared experiences, and with domain on the other. All members, regardless of background, contributed to the cause, and even though they lost the battle, stayed together and formed their own neutral faction and house in a new world. Likewise, one of the two non-native English speaker players in this community, who was the subject of the present research, Miro, used the same affordances and engaged in the social dynamics involved in the community to develop his language skills at the same time that he enjoyed the play. This supportive environment, filled with input, output, noticing, social interaction, feedback and scaffolding, trust and excitement, gave him the potential for second language socialization. This study showed that the dynamics in multiplayer online games can help learners develop and or improve linguistic skills. Also, group participation and collaboration, negotiations of actions, feedback and scaffolds, authenticity and connection, and balanced challenges should be present for an engaging learning experience. The story of Brown Eagle and its consistent perseverance through adversity, among other factors, was about the interaction of these elements which formed close bonds and shared learning experiences for all members. It is important that we use the potential of multiplayer online games to develop engaging learning environments where participants can interact, collaborate, and or compete over solving shared authentic tasks and balance challenges, these elements could facilitate an engaging learning experience and allow students to explore a broader range of knowledge. Finally, gamifying education, that is, using game elements in non-game settings, has been found to be an effective strategy to catalyze engagement, motivation, attention, and investment in learning. To learn more about this study, please feel free to check out these resources. Thanks for joining me on this journey. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.